This is the 155th episode of the Sightcast by MD Edge. And welcome to the Sightcast by MD Edge. A quick announcement this will be our final new episode of 2020. There will be a best of or year in review following this episode next week, if you're listening to this in the week of the 13th and the 14th. And for the final week of the year, there will not be a new Sightcast episode of any kind. There will be instead a hiatus. We will see you with new content in 2021. In episode 155, Dr. Richie Abatia conducts a masterclass on how to identify medical and neurological illnesses that present with psychiatric symptoms and mimic psychiatric diagnoses. So without further ado, please welcome our masterclass lecturer, Dr. Richie Abatia. Psychiatric disorders are diagnoses of exclusion, which means that other possible causes of symptoms need to be ruled out first before attributing the symptoms to a primary psychiatric condition. Several medical conditions can cause symptoms which mimic psychiatric conditions. And at times, these symptoms get mistakenly attributed to a primary psychiatric etiology. This can result in a missed diagnosis of the underlying medical condition. This can be detrimental, especially as the underlying medical condition remains untreated. Today, I will talk about some medical conditions which can masquerade as psychiatric symptoms. This is not an exhaustive list of the medical conditions which can cause or mimic psychiatric symptoms, and this is not a complete review of this subject. Hypothyroidism is a common medical condition which can cause and mimic depressive symptoms. An elevated TSH can signal hypothyroidism. Patients with hypothyroidism may experience constipation, weight gain or edema, cold sensitivity, fatigue, dry skin, or other signs of hypothyroidism. Patients with underlying hypothyroidism may be taking antidepressants and reporting inadequate response to them. Referral to the patient's primary care physician or endocrinologist to treat hypothyroidism is important. Now, delirium is another medical condition, which is a common cause of mood changes and psychosis-like symptoms. Evidence suggests that about 30 to 60% of delirium cases are missed. Delirium has a high mortality rate if untreated. In the hyperactive form of delirium, patients may present with agitation, irritability, restlessness, and hallucinations or delusions. These symptoms are often mistaken for schizophrenia or mania. Delirium can be distinguished by fluctuating levels of consciousness with lucid intervals, disorientation, and an abrupt onset. Visual hallucinations, illusions, significantly impaired attention, visuospatial deficits, and sleep disturbance often occur in delirium. Whereas in primary psychiatric conditions, hallucinations when present tend to be auditory rather than visual and attentional deficits when present are not as marked as those in delirium. The hypoactive form of delirium with symptoms of apathy, decreased alertness and lethargy is often mistaken for depression. The mixed type of delirium may present with features of both hyperactive and hypoactive types of delirium. Now, causes of delirium may be infectious, metabolic, toxic, hypoxic, renal, electrolyte imbalance related, intracranial, and others. Early identification and treatment of the underlying cause is important in delirium. Simple bedside tests, such as the confusion assessment method can be helpful in detecting delirium. Now, HIV infection or AIDS is another medical condition which can cause neuropsychiatric symptoms directly through effects on the brain and the central nervous system or indirectly through opportunistic infections, intracranial tumors, cerebrovascular disease, systemic toxicity, 
or effects of medications. In fact, neuropsychiatric complications can often be some of the first manifestations of AIDS. HIV-related symptoms can mimic a primary depressive disorder, especially due to overlap with the neurovegetative symptoms of primary depression, such as low energy, weight loss, concentration, or memory difficulties. It is important to note that apathy, psychomotor slowing, and working memory deficits are more characteristic of the neuropsychiatry effects of HIV infection or AIDS than of a primary depressive disorder. Psychomotor impairment may even be noticeable in the earliest stages of HIV infection. In late stage HIV dementia complex, bizarre behavior, hallucinations or delusions, and mood disturbance such as euphoria or irritability may occur. Some evidence suggests that hallucinations, delusions, or bizarre behavior in patients with HIV infection may be associated with a progressively worsening course. Therefore, a comprehensive workup should be done in patients with HIV infection who are experiencing these symptoms. It is also worth noting that patients with HIV infection or AIDS can suffer from a primary major depressive disorder as well. Addison's disease is another medical condition which can cause symptoms mimicking primary psychiatric conditions. It is characterized by low blood pressure, hyperpigmentation of the skin, nausea, vomiting, weakness, fatigue, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia. Addisonian crisis can be life-threatening and is a medical emergency. Patients in this crisis can present with delirium, fever, agitation, anxiety, cognitive impairment, and auditory or visual hallucinations. Some evidence suggests that neuropsychiatric symptoms may even be the first manifestations of an Addisonian crisis. Therefore, psychiatrists should maintain a high level of suspicion for Addison's disease. Now moving on to autoimmune encephalitis, which is an increasingly recognized medical condition known to cause several neuropsychiatric symptoms. Anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is the most common type of autoimmune encephalitis and often masquerades as a primary psychotic condition. Some features suggestive of autoimmune encephalitis are a subacute onset with fast progression in less than three months, working memory impairment and personality change, agitation or lethargy, focal neurologic deficits, new onset or rapidly developing catatonia with no prior psychiatric or substance use history, no prodromal symptoms, and with little response to psychotropic medications, marked cognitive impairment, fever, headaches, or flu-like illness, autonomic disturbance such as tachycardia, hypotension, or hypertension. CSF testing can help make the diagnosis. Early involvement of neurologists is key to identifying and treating autoimmune encephalitis. Other causes of encephalitis, such as herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, West Nile virus, and others should be ruled out. Temporal lobe epilepsy or complex partial seizures is another medical condition which can mimic a primary psychiatric disorder. It has certain distinctive features. It is characterized by an aura, which is known as a focal aware seizure. This aura can be in the form of a feeling of fear or an epigastric sensation. Olfactory hallucinations can also be present. The fear may be experienced as a sense of impending doom, and so it may be mistaken for a panic attack. Some individuals may experience feelings of depersonalization or derealization. Following the aura, staring, blinking, behavioral or movement arrest, lip smacking or chewing movements may occur, followed by post-ictal confusion 
and amnesia for the episode, which are distinctive features. Complex partial seizures typically last a few seconds to one to two minutes, which is another feature that can help distinguish them from a primary psychiatric condition. Now, frontotemporal dementia is another medical condition which is often mistaken for a primary psychiatric condition, especially in the initial stages. It is a cluster of underdiagnosed neurodegenerative syndromes characterized by atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes. Progressive behavior change, executive functioning deficits, and a decline in language skills are some of the hallmarks of frontotemporal dementia. It is the second most common type of dementia in individuals less than 65 years of age. Disinhibition, apathy, perseveration, hyperorality can help distinguish frontotemporal dementia from other conditions. Individuals with frontotemporal dementia may also experience depressive symptoms or hallucinations. Problems with attention, memory, concentration, verbal learning, and verbal reasoning are more common in frontotemporal dementia. Other common features are eye movement anomalies, gait anomalies, abnormal reflexes, which can also be helpful in distinguishing this from a primary psychiatric illness. As compared to patients with primary psychiatric conditions, Patients with frontotemporal dementia are often unable to give a history and are more likely to not have a prior psychiatric history or history of psychotropic medication use or a family history of psychiatric illness. Now, stroke is a medical condition which also has high rates of neuropsychiatric sequelae. Individuals with stroke may experience post-stroke depression, post-stroke anxiety, apathy, emotional lability, or personality changes. Depression following acute stroke has been linked with greater cognitive impairment and increased mortality. Individuals with stroke may develop depression hours to days following the stroke. Some studies have linked more severe neurologic deficits, cerebral atrophy, silent infarcts, and white matter lesions with greater risk of post-stroke depression. However, evidence is inconclusive regarding the risk factors for post-stroke depression. Some studies have also linked left frontal lobe lesions with post-stroke depression. And some other evidence suggests that lesions in the right and left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are linked with depression. Other neural circuitry and connections have also been implicated in post-stroke depression. Further research is needed to establish conclusively which hemisphere involvement or type or location of lesion is more likely to lead to post-stroke depression. Diagnosis of post-stroke depression may be challenging at times due to presence of speech language deficits, cognitive impairment, or effects of medications. Studies have also shown transient ischemic attacks or TIAs to be associated with greater risk of depression, underscoring that symptomatic cerebrovascular disease enhances the risk of depression. Certain evidence suggests that for some individuals, post-stroke depression may resolve even spontaneously. Individualized treatment that takes into account the patient's unique clinical situation along with evidence in close coordination with the neurology team is the best approach. Patients with stroke often experience apathy. Apathy in stroke patients is often linked with depression and cognitive deficits. However, it can exist independently of depression or cognitive deficits. Apathy is often linked with greater severity of functional decline in stroke patients. Now let's talk about Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a rare genetic condition involving excess copper accumulation in the liver and brain, commonly manifesting first in the form of psychiatric symptoms, which often predate neurological signs. 
Given how common it is for a patient with Wilson's disease to present with psychiatric symptoms, Wilson's disease has been called the great masquerader. Personality changes, depression, aggression, psychotic symptoms may occur in patients with Wilson's disease. There have been case reports of patients having been diagnosed with schizophrenia for years before being diagnosed with Wilson's disease. Parkinson's disease is another medical condition mimicking depression. Depressive symptoms in Parkinson's disease are thought to be a result of the neural degeneration caused by the disease. Fatigue, psychomotor slowing, decreased range of facial expressions, postural changes, and sleep disturbance are common in patients with Parkinson's disease. There are several other medical conditions such as multiple sclerosis, Lyme's disease, syphilis, Lewy body dementia, Huntington's disease, and others, which can mimic primary psychiatric conditions and are important to know about, but we are not going to be covering those in today's talk. A comprehensive history, physical, neurological, and cognitive examination, and lab testing are some of the key steps in evaluating for medical conditions that may be underlying psychiatric symptoms. Additionally, brain imaging may be indicated in certain scenarios, such as when a patient exhibits new focal neurologic deficits, or if there is a history of head trauma or falls. Additional investigations, especially neurologic ones, are even more important when the age or timing of onset of symptoms is atypical, or when the overall presentation or course of psychiatric symptoms is atypical, or when significant or out of proportion cognitive impairment is present, or when movement disorders or seizures are present. It is also worth noting that visual hallucinations are not typical of a primary psychiatric condition. If present, they should prompt concerns for an underlying medical condition especially if substance use or substance withdrawal has been ruled out. To sum up, a condition that looks like a psychiatric condition on first glance may not actually be psychiatric. Several medical conditions cause symptoms which mimic psychiatric conditions. Therefore, evaluating and treating the whole person is important rather than addressing symptoms only. For many of these medical conditions, early detection, timely referral to specialists, and coordination with the medical team is crucial and can be life-saving. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of the Psychcast by MD Edge. The Psychcast is produced by MD Edge Psychiatry editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. All of our podcasts are produced by MD Edge Executive Editor Kathy Scarbeck.